Born in 1759, Mary Wollstonecraft was an avid enthusiast of the French Revolution and every bit its adherent. She was considered a founding feminist philosopher by the 21st century intelligentsia, and Wollstonecraft was better known during her lifetime for her sexual indiscretion and numerous relationships than she was for her writing. One such relationship was with the political anarchist William Godwin. This relationship produced a daughter, whose name was Mary, also. She would come to champion many of the same anarchist, revolutionary, and feminist ideals. Mary the Younger would go on to wed one of her father's political followers, Percy Shelley, who was married to someone else when they began a sexual relationship together. After his death, she would engage in sexual relationships with women. She also kept Percy's charred hearts in her desk as a souvenir. Percy would gain recognition after his death for his poetry, while Mary went on to write a work of fiction that would start an entire horror genre. That work, of course, was Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. What is often overlooked about the book, however, is that it wasn't meant to celebrate the sexual revolutionary ideals of the French Revolution. Instead, it was meant to show, at least in part, how monstrous they had become in Shelley's life. The book was, according to E. Michael Jones, written as, quote, a protest against the sexual revolutionary theories of the day by someone who had gotten badly burned by close exposure to them, end quote. The irony is, of course, thick here. The woman who is celebrated as a champion of this sexual revolution was actually lobbying a damning expose against it with Frankenstein. She had seen firsthand how monstrous sexual immorality could become, killing everything she loved in the process. She had a tormented and quite frankly weird relationship with Percy, and her lifestyle contributed to the suicides of her half-sister and of Percy's wife. A monster cannot be controlled the way you think it can. Today, the sexual revolution has metastasized and gone globally viral. The whole world, in one sense, is a monstrous freak show. It is the Frankensteinian sexual nightmare that the world can't seem to wake up from. The King's Hall exists to make self-ruled men who rule well and win the world. Well, welcome back to the King's Hall. Uh, it is fitting that here in the month of June, when the world celebrates pride in sexual perversion with Pride Month, that we would be doing this episode on Christian sexuality against the modern sex cult. And uh, before we get into the body of the episode, let me plug uh, a small project that we're doing that you might file under the category of, I don't know, poking the gods of the age in both eyes, uh, an exercise in satire. If you go to our YouTube channel or our Twitter or, you know, a lot of our different channels, you'll see that we shared a video on June 1st at the beginning of Pride Month. Uh, and it's a satiric video. I won't ruin it here. Go it was give Dan's it idea. It was all Dan's idea. Fine. Well, it was allegorical. Well, we won't hold that against you. That's for each man to decide for himself. I'll take credit for it. It was <laughs> a, right. genius it was a genius idea. genius idea. I also idea wrote it all and did the video design. That's right. While we're taking credit Dan for things Dan did all of that. <laughs> 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 and uh, so here in Pride Month, we wanted to take an opportunity to do just that, to, through satire, poke the gods of the age in both eyes. We've got a couple different promotions running here. If you sign up for our Patreon during Pride Month, which is one of the best ways to fight back against the spirit of the age, you know, not only will you gain access to all the normal Patreon stuff like our special after hours show that we do with every single episode of the King's Hall, you will also get sent to you free of charge an NTFA Pride Month mug. What? And I'm just going to tell you what NTFA stands for, and then you're going to have to watch the video to understand anything that I'm talking about. NTFA is the National Trans Frog Alliance. So... <laughs> Make sure you sign up for Patreon here in the month of June, and we've got a special tea, a special mug, special video, and I don't know, maybe we'll make this our June tradition here at the King's Hall. I mean, think about this. You join Patreon. They're going to get this t-shirt. Brian, I don't even have one. I am the only one who owns one currently in the entire world. And you use it on a daily basis. I use it on a daily basis. That is correct. Uh, and again, we're going to leave you hanging here. You're going to have to go check that out. You can also see it at kingshall.org slash store. I believe it is the store button on our website. But that said, Eric, what is it that we are taking up today? What's our, what's our topic? Yeah, it seems very fitting. As you said, we're in the middle of June. And so we're talking about Freud, the sexual revolution, and really where this all has taken us culturally. So in an earlier episode titled The Creed of Their High Places, we started to take our Boniface size axe 
to the green groves and high places of the pagans. So in the last few episodes, our goal has been to demolish the lofty and idolatrous assertions of this secular humanist religion. In this episode, we want to set our sights on one of the most pernicious and seductive and well-attended pagan green groves, and that is the pagan altar that is the humanist sexuality cult. It's the place where gender identity and sexual expression find their most zealous adherents. Now, central to this high place is the fundamental religious assertion that man is primarily a sexual animal, and his chief end is to be true to that sexual inner self and to express that sexual inner self. This ideology burst onto the scene in America during the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s and has come to reign with absolutizing force in American culture today through woke identity politics. But here's the thing. If you trace it back, it didn't start in the 1960s. It has roots that stretch back at least to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and to authors like Mary Shelley and William Blake. One of the most significant figures, however, in framing what would become the sexual revolution is our man, we talked about him before, Sigmund Freud. It was Sigmund Freud who helped promote a central idea. Sex was no longer seen as merely an activity, but became central to a person's fundamental identity. For Freud, the goal of human existence was to be happy, and happiness lay chiefly in one's ability to pursue whatever form of sexual expression they desired. In the words of Carl Truman, in this view, quote, sexual satisfaction is promoted as one of the key components of what it means to be living the good life. Freud provided a compelling rationale for putting sex and sexual expression at the center of human existence. The myth is the idea that sex, in terms of sexual desire and sexual fulfillment, is the real key to human existence, to what it means to be truly human, end quote. Now, because the sexual animal is all that really matters, expression of it is vital to human existence. This is where our concept of gender or sexual identity really comes from. That's why today, to deny the use of someone's quote-unquote preferred pronouns, or to deny that a person would be biologically a different sex than their hidden gender identity, as many claim, is tantamount to denying their authentic self or core identity. You see, if you do this, you're denying their personhood. In this view, a refusal to acknowledge that Tom might really deep down be a Sally or a Tiffany or a Brittany is to deny him basic rights of human existence. It's not a stretch to say that many view this type of denial as criminal. It's become that in many cases in our society. It's not enough that someone be allowed to practice something privately. It has to be publicly acknowledged by everyone. It's why anyone who opposes the LGBTQ plus movement is labeled with some kind of phobia, transphobia, homophobia, for example, because irrational fear or hatred must be the cause of such opposition. If you say something culturally taboo, you are likely to face real reprisals. You could be fired, you could be canceled, or you could be sued simply for disagreeing with a Freudian view of human sexuality. Now, the other main contribution from Freud was that he sexualized everything about childhood, and he did it with scientific jargon that made it all sound so plausible. His five phases of childhood development were all hypersexualized, and this made children's sexuality fair game particularly for educators and quote-unquote scientific professionals. It is one huge reason why children's sexuality is a prime target for the transgender movement today and why they are working so hard to get into education. Parents are seen as repressive agents, as an extension of the repressive patriarchal family, while the state's teachers are there to liberate the libidos of kindergartners. Now, gentlemen, we're going to jump into some questions, but first I want to, I want to cover what I'm calling the Freudian three-step. So there's a three-part progression that took place from Freud to the sexual revolution to the sexual politics of today. Again, quoting Carl Truman here, the self must first be psychologized, psychology must then be sexualized, and sex must then be politicized, end quote. Today, everything has been psychologized, sexualized, and now it's being politicized. What better example, as we've already talked about, the month of June, Pride Month, which has corporations lining up with rainbow flags all over their profiles. Virtue signaling to the max, gentlemen, it definitely is that. By the way, June 5th, St. Boniface Day, on a Sunday of all days, Brian. Mm, yes. So we're, we're taking the axe, Boniface style. I want to ask you guys a first question here. And, and that's this. Is this true? The Freudian concept that 
h- human beings are fundamentally, their sexual identity is, is fundamentally, it's about just sex. Do you think that's true? No. For, so first of all, obviously, as a Christian, we would say no. The core of human identity is not his sexuality. And, and, and I would say that for a few reasons. And then, and then I'm interested to see and to talk a little bit about why they would choose something like sexuality to make the Asherah pole and why that's so consistent. Like why you see that in ancient Canaanite religion, Sumerian religion, Greek religion, Roman religion, pagan Germanic religion. I mean, sex gets turned into a God so readily in, in human history. Now, I, I think that the way that a, a Christian could really simply answer this question to say, no, while sex is very important, it's very central. It's not the core of what it means to be human. And, and, and for two reasons, first of all, because even back in Genesis where we see that it's not good for the man to be alone, that he needs a, a partner who is other than him sexually, even in order to be fruitful and fulfill his mission, that even then at the center of his identity is still this unique status amongst creatures as God's image bearer, mm. as God's icon and all that that means. And God is not a sexual being, right? God is not a sexual being, even though God has, you know, I, I'm not going to say preferred pronouns. That actually seems blasphemous. God reveals himself to us as father and son with male pronouns. Obviously that that's true of God, but God is, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, right? He's not a man, so are you saying Bethel was wrong to sing Good Good Mother? Oh, oh that, well, that was, that was actually someone covering Bethel. Yes. Was it actually Bethel? I thought it was someone I, covering I it. I thought it was like a Bethel knockoff church. I don't know. It was like a lumberjack oh, dyke lady e- singing it. But. Either way, it was bad. And then the other place I would go is to say that Jesus tells us that, that in the eternal state, there won't be marriage. So, so right there, sex has a purpose. It has many purposes, typological purposes, purposes in our dominion mandate and in fruitfulness and in preaching and communicating many glorious things. I, I now I'm self-conscious every time I say the word glorious here in this podcast. Since that's so true. Pe- <laughs> Thank you. Eric. That's mine. The Twitter people will truly understand why we're laughing, it's but no, I would go dryer, to those the, the, yeah, dovetail dyer carpenter, King of Maine. Yep. Shout out. Uh, Shout out to you, man. I would say that for those two reasons, we can say that while sex is a, to be sexual is to, is part of what it means to be human in our creatureliness now that sexuality is not the core feature of humanness period. But I would say more fundamentally our status as God's image bearers and the mission that God gave us is more fundamental. So, so it brings up an interesting question. You kind of hinted at this at the beginning and Dan, maybe I'll kick this your way. So you go back to Mary Shelley and the French revolution uh, one of the things that they did was try to destabilize family relations through things like pornography, Mary Shelley and others celebrating, you know, just these heinous sexual acts and sins and whatever else. How do you see sexuality, the exploitation of sexuality being so central to like revolution? Mm. Why are those connected? Mm, that's a really good question. I think one of the reasons is because natural man is easy to manipulate. Yep. Through desires. Through his appetites. Through, exactly. Sexuality through is appetites. definitely powerful. Very powerful. I mean, I've heard people say uh, certain radical things about masculinity. Like if without sex and a sex drive, men would have no motivation to build, mm. you know, to fight, to win, things like that. And so I think that that is a core element to the demon gods of, of our world yeah. manipulating image bearers through their appetites, like Brian said, is through their sexual appetites. And so I think that's one of the reasons. I don't know what, if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, I I do think that carnal man, like there's a reason that carnality is one of the key identifiers of man in the flesh, man in Adam, man in his fallenness, is that these desires that were supposed to serve in an unfallen, innocent, or righteous state, they were supposed to function as compass bearings, pointing you to fulfilling your duties. So your God-given duties, your appetites, your desires in an, in an innocent or righteous state actually pointed you to being what you were made to be. So sex and sexual desire was a good thing that pointed you towards fruitfulness and dominion and things that, you're, that are actually God-glorifying. So whenever you get a, a, a good, glorious appetite that God's given you, 
and then you add sin to the equation, to the degree that that thing was a powerful good, it will be an even more powerful evil. So this is, you know, even back to the question I, I posited in the beginning here, I think that the reason that sexuality gets put in the seat of worship so often in human history and so consistently, everything again from the Asherah poles, which are just phallic symbols, to these ancient fertility gods and cults, to Aphrodite and the temple of Aphrodite and Greek and Roman culture, you know, as we, it's just a consistent theme. And it's, I think the reason is because it was made to be such a powerful servant of God in man's mission as God's image bearer that the temptation, as soon as you dislocate and stop worshiping God, the proper object of worship, you will start worshiping the next things down in your mind in terms of glory and goodness and pleasure and joy. And sex is such an obvious, it's such a powerful good that it's easy to see why when you stop worshiping God, you would worship sex. Yeah, I think that is really huge. And you, you would think about even Israel, right? They're pictured as God's bride. They're committing adultery. Uh, Jeremiah says, you're, you're a whore. You know, you go to these yeah. green groves in high places and it's fundamentally a adulterous sexual act, even spiritually yeah. uh, speaking. So that tends to make sense. I said early on, that one of the claims here is the chief end of man is to be true to the sexual inner self and to express that sexual self. So maybe one of the questions we could ask just quite simply is what is the chief end of man? This what is where is you have to chief sing. chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I've, oh, we harmonized there at the I didn't, end. I, I, I was harmonizing. Uh, okay. That was yeah. pretty based. Yeah, I mean, I've listened to that maybe once. Nailed and it's it. like in my, it's ingrained. ingrained in my head. Now I cannot hear anything else. So yeah, I read that question. So I want to ask that uh, if it's the chief end of man, yeah. you, you've just sung this beautiful rendition. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe we did the whole thing. But yeah, that was un- a, unpack that for me. How does that contrast with the chief end of man is sexual expression? If we say that man's chief end, and I think rightly is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That, that means that there's this, dialogical or relational aspect to man's nature, Mm. meaning that you cannot atomize, you can't isolate an individual and have him be and do what he was made to be and do. Man was was created for relation vertically with God, horizontally with, with other humans, and then even vertically downwards with creation. And, and all of that's wrapped up in this question. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Meaning that, We're supposed to, as we relate to God, reflect back his glory. That's what we were made to be and do. And then in that act of reflecting back his glory and walking in our nature as image bearers, that that is actually made to be pleasurable and enjoyable. So think of how many, I mean, how many uh, aberrant worldviews and philosophies are refuted in that concept. That refutes Gnostic asceticism, uh, where pleasure is bad, the body's bad, you know, it refutes you. I mean, we can go down the line. We've talked about a lot of them, but you can see how this demonic negative image or perversion of that statement, that chief and a man would be to become to express my inner sexual self and to, you know, be my inner sexual self. It's like, I have to, because I wasn't, I was created to be in relationship and to not be an atom floating around by myself. I can't actually be satisfied in my identity unless it's being reflected to somebody else, received by them, affirmed by them, unless there's a relational component to the expression of myself. So I think just like any other sin, you always see that it's parasitic or it perverts some good thing. Sin, sin doesn't create ex nihilo. It gets in and corrupts or it you know, acts parasitically towards something God created. Since sin can't create anything at all, it can only corrupt that which God created. You know, we see that man whose chief end is to glorify and relate to God and enjoy him and find his pleasure and his ultimate satisfaction in those things. We would see that whatever you make a God, you will make it the chief end to glorify that thing and enjoy that thing forever. And there's always going to be a relational component to that since we weren't created to be these atoms floating around. I mean, does that make sense? You guys following yeah, I think what so. I'm saying there? So uh, somewhere in the introduction or in the Mary Shelley story, yeah. I think you brought up uh, one of the byproducts of the French Revolution and French Enlightenment thinking was this idea of the pursuit of happiness. Yes. So, so in a way, you could say that the foundations of the sexual revolution that has manifested itself and where we find ourselves today with 
rainbow flags flying everywhere in defiance of the high and living one and true living God is that ultimately the United States foundations were built off of French enlightenment thinking with Thomas Jefferson authoring a lot of the founding documents, ben the Franklin. pursuit of happiness, you know, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness being the core of the American ideal. And so it, like Brian had said, when we when you turn and you start worshiping the the uh, fertility gods, uh, which is ironic, and I'm sure we'll get into it at some point with the lack of fertility, yeah, yeah, <laughs> of of people in our time. But it, this pursuit of happiness instead of the pursuit of the glorification of God and finding our enjoyment in that, because God doesn't say no sex, He doesn't say like don't eat the fat, uh, you know, on uh, good food. Right. He d- He doesn't say don't drink the wine. He says yes to all of those things and acknowledging him as the creator of every good and perfect gift. And he says yes to those things. And here's, here's the context for them. You should enjoy this because it is going to be, it is actually going to give you happiness. It's going to give you joy in, in enjoying these things rightly. But because so much of our modern enlightenment thinking has been turned inward on itself pursuing my individual happiness as an independent free agent from God, it has twisted itself into quite honestly, like a monster far worse than Frankenstein. Well, and I think that's the point. Um, so if you read E. Michael Jones, uh, I think Monsters from the Id. Monsters Brian, from the Id, yeah. He makes this exact argument. And he says that uh, Mary Shelley, essentially what she's doing is showing when you change the definition of freedom and liberty in the French Revolution, right? Liberty as being, you know, total you know, unbounded sexual expression. That yeah. would be one form. So they say that's liberty. Really what you've done is you've created a monster that you can now not control. Of course, if you read the story, Prometheus, you know, going back to Greek, he's the Titan who gives uh, man fire. So technology, and then mm-hmm. is punished by the gods. The birds come and pick his liver out every day. It grows back and they pick it out again. So the, the enlightenment is really showing that Frankenstein was supposed to be this Prometheus through science and technology, we can conquer uh, all the problems in the world. The problem is they do that. They get rid of traditional Christian morality, and then it turns into this monster. Of course, in the book, the monster kills, you know, he kills the spouse, and it's this terrible, tragic, horrible story. So I think that's really where we're at, where these Enlightenment ideals today have turned monstrous. Yeah. So one of, one of the questions I want to ask you guys is about the fruit of this enlightenment thinking in our culture. I was reading a study from 2018. 2018 study claimed that over 50% of male transgender individuals attempt suicide. I don't know what percentage is successful. Over 50%. So if you believe this, you know, gender identity, you know, sexual self-expression is the key to happiness, people do it and then they're utterly unhappy. They've got a monster on their hands. So my question is, where else do you see this culturally? What is the fruit downstream of this sexual ethos? Yeah, it's like when you create, when you worship that which is not God, it always biblically degrades and enslaves you. I think those are the two themes. And ultimately, both of those lead to death. You're, you're being enslaved to death, which degrades you. So you see these, you know, what's, what's fascinating about this transgender mind virus that's going around is that what it's promising is that technological divine man can take hold of himself and through technology, surgical technology, elixirs of, you know, chemical technology, literally technology. Frankenstein. We're going to chop you up. Yeah. Stitch you back together. You. We're going to take your male genitals and we're going to turn them into female genitals. We're going to take female genitals and, you know, attempt to make male genitalia. And, and, what it's promising is this ultimate liberation and freedom and self-expression. It's promising that you can become gods. I mean, really at the end of the day that you can this have the power battle. of yeah, self-definition, self-glorification. Tra- and it's, you know, it ends up being instead of renewal and transformation, this great word that I want every King's Hall listener to write down. Transmogrification is the word. And it means like an absurd transformation. Interesting. That's what it ends up being. Instead of transformation into glory, it becomes transmogrification where you end up enslaved and degraded to where this thing that is actually beautiful. Think about how beautiful human sexuality actually is Mm. in its creational and divinely appointed purpose. There is almost, I mean, 
there are few things in creation that are more glorious than a beautiful naked woman to whom you are married. There's, I mean, Adam, when he sees Eve, he's say, I hear at last is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. When you think about the power, again, back to this, why would it end up being worship? The power of human sexuality through human sexuality, you see the creation of immortal souls, mm. these souls that will live forever. And so what all of these sexual perversions do in exalting this great, beautiful, you know, glorious thing to the state of Godhood and then attempting to worship it is they always end up degraded. it. And you start looking at this beautiful act of sexual union is perverted into men penetrating and sodomizing one another where the poop comes out. I mean, I just really wish you hadn't said that. I'm, I'm so, no, this is this this is what you, when I Paul mean, that's says, the actual reality. Like yeah, you, is, you can put is, a rainbow flag over yeah. it and make it seem nice, but and if you're listening to this and you're like, well, that's kind of graphic. Well, Paul says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them in Ephesians five eleven. So one of the things that you can do, uh, there was a great article a guy named Tabidi Anyabwile wrote about uh, recovering no. your gag reflex. Ron Burns. To, Ron Burns. When it comes to homosexual sex. Because if you think about what it actually is, you start to see the way that it's actually taken this beautiful thing and degraded it in the same way that, you know, Mary Shelley created this horror genre. And, and the way that that's morphed, if you look at these, some art house niche horror genres today and things like film, they actually made fun of this in The Office with Gabe. These films that are like 30 minutes, they have no plot. They're just disgusting maggots and yeah. rot and filth. And they're, they're designed to unsettle you. Right. Human beings, we can't help but destroy what we worship if that thing is not capable of bearing the weight of human worship. So sex is no different when you see the you can see the fruit of it anywhere. Anywhere you follow the worship of sex, you will find degradation, death, enslavement. That's what you'll find. Does it surprise you, Dan, that Freud set the stage for our world today? But I was thinking about some stories in Alabama that hit the news this week, one of which is State Farm supporting, I, I can't remember the name of the organization. You can look it up. It made national news, but State Farm is supporting an organization that is infiltrating schools and giving transgender books to like kindergartners. Wow. Uh, Nike supports it. Adidas, a oh. bunch of other big companies Season are supporting oh. this. I saw <laughs> Brian reaching for a Glock, maybe. I was about to say a, a keyword that would have immediately got us canceled. Do you know what I'm saying though? It's like, <laughs> I guess I just want, why, why are they going after kids? Why is Freud going after kids? And as we'll, we'll dig into this in a little bit, but they are going after your kids. People have to know this. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the themes throughout this whole episode will be that people that worship demon gods, the demon gods of sex mm. turn into monsters. You turn into Molech. They turn in. Yeah, exactly. I was Molech is a great example. And so this hmm. is a, they're sacrificing your children on the altar of Molech is what they're doing. Yeah. And really this whole thing is, is just an absolute monstrous tragedy. Like trying to turn every kid into a Frankensteinian. So, exactly. Yeah. So you say, you know, that up to 50% <laughs> of transgender males attempt suicide. Okay. And over 30 for women. So, so yeah. there, there you go. There, there's bearing fruit. You're seeing where the transgender movement has has bore fruit and it's in, it's in death. It's in, uh, I, people that don't actually want to exist. They want to decreate themselves. That's right. And so further, I mean, cause the, the only next step other than completely defacing the image of God in surgical means and through, uh, coverings of makeup and, and just false nails and hair and, and all of that is actually uh, death. Yeah. That is the next step of uncreation. And so, it's so monstrous because children obviously are, are innocent, but you have these people that are on the sidelines that not only partake in what's going on, but encourage others to partake in it. And to the extreme of we're going to indoctrinate children as even behind your back in order to make sure that we get our agenda pushed to make sure that our God, their, their God, their God, yeah. the demon God of sex gets its glory. And what really, really makes me mad, Eric, what really makes me mad is then you have supposed mainstream and even reformed Christians 
that are like, yeah, we, we get that this is a sin, but we're going to be tolerable towards certain movements. You have certain movements that are like, yeah, covenant friendship's okay. Like oh, yeah. if you're a guy and you find another guy attractive, like you can live with him as long as you don't do anything, you know, but you can live with them in a covenant friendship. Should I call you mister? Or even, you know, to the point of accepting homosexuality in their church. Mm. Yeah. And it is absolutely monstrous because then you have issues like you had throughout uh, old covenant Israel, where they would bring in gods into the temple, false gods, or they would partake, like you said, into the green groves and high places with temple prostitutes. And, and actually it was, it's interesting as, as you look through the old covenant, I believe it was Moab who sent their women in to the camp in Israel uh, to attempt to draw uh, their people away. Was that with Phineas? I think that was the, that's a story I'm thinking when of. When Phineas but. ran them through with a spear. Correct. Was Correct. Blessed Declined. by God. Yes. And exactly. then you see. like winsome nuance? Is I, think, I think Phineas <laughs> is definitely the and, definition of winsome. Then, I mean, his, so his pictures are What there. you're talking about, Dan, is you have godly Phineas, uh, the Levite, I believe, who runs the, who, who cleanses the camp of sexual immorality. That's yes. a perfect picture of what we ought to be doing, where you, you give no quarter to the demon gods of Molech. And then later, what we have are the anti Phineas, who's the son of uh, Eli, the priest. His name was also Phineas, Hophni and Phineas, the two sons of Eli that end up being killed by God, who are sleeping with women at the entrance of the temp- tent. Yeah. So God gives us these two Phineases. One of them is a perfect picture in scripture of the destruction of sexual sin from the camp. And then you see the other one who's sinning sexually and God destroys him. That's interesting because the judgment then on Eli is that his generations are blotted out. That's right. No fertility. So back, back to Eric's question, why the kids? Yeah. It's like, you'd see again, it's always this demonic inversion where godly, beautiful sexuality creates children and life. What they want to do is take the product of the womb to take the fruit of the womb, like a dragon and, and actually make them into eunuchs so that those children cannot be fruitful themselves. And it's like a biblically, it's a, it's a slow death because you've, you've kept them from being able to produce fruit. And one of the, one of the aspects of the gospel that's so um, good is that actually one of the promises, this is why there's great hope for, for transgender men and women who have marred themselves and have made themselves eunuchs is that God actually promises in Isaiah, for example, that the eunuch, the dry branch, will be the father of multitudes. So, so through the gospel, if you're listening to this and you happen to be transgender or you know somebody, one of the, the ways that we share the hope of Christ with transgender people is by promising them that even though they've done everything they can to cut off their own legacy, God in his grace can actually resurrect and bring restoration mm. to where even if they can't have children, God will provide an inheritance for the eunuch who repents and trusts in Christ. So that there's hope. I think, you know, one of the, one of the thing people probably hear when we talk about this, they're like, why are you being so hateful and unloving? And it's like, we want to be completely ungentle with the idols of the day and, and partly to protect the sheep and our children from being discipled by them. We want our sheep and our children to think of those things as ridiculous, laughable follies worthy of mockery. But we also we do that because we don't want those transgender people to die and cut off their own legacy. We want to see them become Christians. We want to see them repent of their sin and come to, to see the absurdity of what they've done and then to find hope in Christ. So it's like, you know, though death brings degradation and enslavement, it's not, that, it's not as if Christ can't bring restoration. I think that's an important part of the, yeah. the message of this season is that we're not just talking about tearing things down and death, 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 and charge the hill all the time. It's like doing that for the sake of life. That's why we're doing this. Yeah, and it's a good segue because the next thing that I want to ask about is just, and we've done this to some extent, but painting a picture of the opposite of this Frankensteinian sexuality. What are we trying to accomplish, especially think about our, our kids? We've yeah. talked a lot about that. Brian, you've talked a lot about this, but what, what is the chief aim of sexuality? And then how, how do you, in the midst of this culture of death, this culture that is literally exhibiting yeah. the judgment and under the curse, what do we do to portray life and the beauty of sexuality? Right. And Paul answers this question in a poignant way in Ephesians 5, 
when he says, I tell you the truth, this mystery is profound. It refers to Christ in the church. He's talking about a man leaving his father and mother, holding fast his wife. The two will become one flesh. What Paul is saying is that at the union of the bride and the groom, life happens. That's what you're supposed to, you're supposed to see the gospel in that. Human sexuality is supposed to be this great parable, living parable in technicolor that when the bride and the groom come together, that there is life and joy and pleasure and peace and all these great things, you know, that's what happens when a bride wins his wife, you know, he comes and, and he, he wins his wife. He, he brings her to himself. He prepares a place for her. And then he, he unites himself to her in sexual union. And the result is generations and fruit and legacy. And, and that's ultimately just this great big picture of Christ who leaves the house of his father to win his bride, to prepare a place for her. And then at their union, there's life and joy and peace in our union with Christ. You know, that's why Song of Solomon is a book that, that has great typological significance. This book about sex and married sexual relationship has this great typological significance in portraying the glory of Christ and, and the goodness of Christ, that Christ is satisfying, that he is good and gives life and, and all these things. So, you know, that's why it's such an offensive thing for the world to make this mockery of sex. It's not just doing a sin. It's not just like, oh, that was, you're, you're doing a sin with your boy parts and your lady parts. It's like, oh no, stop doing that. No having fun. No, you're, you're, you're going into the Louvre and you're scrawling on the Mona Lisa with, you know, bright yellow spray paint. It's just, well, or human feces would be a better one again, but you, you've already, dear listener, had to listen to one reference to <laughs> I sodomy. I mean, somebody did throw a cake at it just recently. So Did they? Oh, yeah, they did. At the Mona Lisa. You know, so the, we've talked a lot, I think, through our episodes on, previous episodes on the King's Hall, about human sexuality. Essentially, we've talked about it, even without saying it directly, what is the mission of man? Like, what is this, what is the mission that we're supposed to be accomplishing? God always provides the tools necessary to accomplish this mission. Uh, obviously through the Holy Spirit and the changing of dead men to, to spiritually alive men, but then also. Yeah. Taking dominion and fruitfulness. Yeah. Taking dominion and fruitfulness. So he's, he's going to make you want to do those things and give you the tools to do them. Yeah. And so it shouldn't be surprised then when we look around the, the secular world, they, they have their chance to uh, be fruitful themselves. What would they, what would they attack? What would they, where would they attack their, their, um, you know, the concentration of fire. And it would make sense that in any, any culture that, that is not Christian historically, women have been subjugated, like treated horribly. And it's, it, that should not be a surprise to us because we see this in Genesis in the garden, that there is going to be enmity between the woman and between the serpent. Yeah. There was going to be en- en- enmity between them. And so we, it shouldn't surprise us when women are, encouraged to, to be barren, right. To not produce fruit, to sacrifice their children, to actually look like men. Yeah. And then the, the opposite is true that men are supposed to be these, you know, testosterone laden chads that would sacrifice their own lives for their people. Uh, even if that's just working yourself to death, yeah. uh, to provide and to protect and men have been effeminized to the point where they look more like women. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right, Dan. And I think, you know, pertinent to this conversation, like why do we have these conversations? What would be the benefit for people? I know for me, reading something maybe a little heady, like Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, it's really made me appreciate, look, when when you're scrolling Spotify or you're on TV and you're watching commercials and there's this constant bombardment of sexualized content, um, your kids, like you're, you're trying to protect them. And no matter what, it's like, seems like something is screaming yeah. a sexual immorality in their face all the time. You have to understand as a dad, you may be like a blue collar lineman, but you've got to understand as a dad, the play that is being run against you. That's right. And so you cannot just take the easy route and send your kids to public school and then watch on TV. Well, why is the world going left and sexually woke and yeah. identity politics? You actually have to do something about this. That's right. And you have to, again, you have to understand the play that's being run here with sexuality. But I guess the last thing I would say is just along the lines of understanding the play that's being run, you can think about it kind of like 
these rat experiments. Have you ever heard of these experiments that were done on rats? And I, I can't remember the details when they happened. You can Google this. You'll probably find the exact numbers and, and whatnot. But they've, they've done these studies with, with rats where scientists take uh, these lab rats. This, you know, that's literally where we get the phrase lab rats. They, they literally do this. I'm really curious and, what he's and they, um, by the way. All I can hear is the sound. They, yeah. <laughs> and you can kind of picture the, they put them in these boxes and in these wire cages with, you know, all sorts of tunnels and mazes and places they can go. And a lot of the experiments come down to seeing if they can get, change the rat's behavior based on different prizes, basically, different treats. Yeah. And one of them that I've heard of is that every time they perform a certain task, like press a button, they get, it's like, it's like heroin. It, 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 there was one where they literally gave the rats drugs and, and heroin. Some of these drugs, they basically flood your brain with dopamines and, op, you know, whatever. I can't remember if it's dopamine, serotonin or whatever. And and then they see what happens. And they're like studies on the nature of addiction and on the physiological response to decision making with respect to pleasure seeking behavior. And, and sex is this great concentrated pleasure. So so what do you think happens when they give the rat a button that well, I think the experiment was it, the first time they touch it, it gives them the hit of heroin or whatever, the, the dopamine rush. And then it doesn't give it to them again until they hit it maybe a hundred times. And then the rat will keep pressing the button until it gets it. And then they do it until it doesn't give them until they hit it a thousand times. And then they just stop giving them any response. And I think the rats will literally press the button thousands and thousands of times. And, you know, it just complete all they do. They're consumed with it, but they're not getting any reward anymore. Th- this is basically what happens when you abuse God's pleasures. He even made us physiologically to respond to things like sex, arousal, pheromones. You know, when you see your wife, we've talked about in other, I think hard man and bright hearth, we've talked about testosterone and the relationship between the man and the woman, where when she's ovulating, she's telling him with these pheromone markers, like basically, Come and get it's me. go time. Yeah. Come on, let's do this. And so there's a whole, this whole monthly cycle of relationship in a marriage. And I'm trying to be like PG here, although I've already talked about sodomy. So I guess <laughs> like, at this point, you know, we're and, canceled. I mean, they're going to yeah, put an explicit rating yeah, on this right, podcast. E. Social credit deducted. But you see how, you know, God designed for us not to worship the pleasure But to pursue it in a way that produces life, this whole ovulation cycle, the woman's fertility cycle, and what pornography, what the the hormone pill plus pornification of culture plus sexualization of everything does is it makes human beings like that rat pressing that button. And the first time they discover porn at age 10 or 11 or 8 or 9 or whatever it is now, they get that flood of dopamine and we're rats in the cage. And then they want you to just press that button over and over and over and over and over and over until you have 15 year old boys who are impotent and have erectile dysfunction because they can't be sexually aroused anymore through even the most hardcore forms of pornography because they are the rat. Yeah. And I think realizing that the smartphone, yeah, there's a book called dopamine nation. Yeah. Like your smartphone is like, they're continually social media, continually giving you that drip of dopamine. So yeah, I think being cognizant of that. The other thing, and I want to move into this, is what I'm calling the perfect ideological storm. Yeah. So sort of like we talk about in theology and the Bible, all your doctrines are interconnected. Mm-hmm. And so there's sort of like this, you know, set of systematic theology for secular humanism. So ultimately, the cultural revolution we've seen in the last 70 years represents a convergence of what I'm talking about, these ideologies, right? We've got Rousseau's philosophy. We've got Freud's sexualized psychology. We've got Darwin's evolutionary theory. We've got Marx's political machinations. One way we can connect these is by looking at Herbert Marcuse of the Frankfurt School and Wilhelm Reich, uh, who was around, you know, these guys are 30s and 40s, 1930s and 40s, both of whom are adherents of critical theory. They believe that the sexual revolution and political revolution were necessary to each to each other. Yeah. Reich argued, for example, that the family and patriarchal structure was authoritarian and oppressive and that social engineers had a duty, so statists had a duty to free young people and their libidos from the rule of oppressive parents. So if that doesn't set you yeah, off. Wow, wow. Yeah. This is why the parents in Virginia and other places are so upset. That's right. Because this is exactly what's happening. This is according to their plan. Now, in fact, Reich wrote that, quote, the patriarchal family is the single most important unit of ideological control for an oppressive totalitarian regime. 
The state, he said, therefore must be used to coerce families and where necessary, actively punish those who dissent from sexual liberation. Reich believed that the state has the right to intervene in family matters because the family is potentially the primary opponent of political liberation through its cultivation and policing of traditional sexual codes. So, gentlemen, here's the point. Reich and others saw the erosion of sexual mores as essential to eroding society in general. The sexual revolution was aimed predominantly at the family, which stood as the key obstacle to remaking the world in such an image. Now, Brian, you found this out recently. Not yeah. so, you know, a couple months ago. Not uh, yeah, too several recent. Times. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brian has found out that the modesty conversation is a hot button issue. Why? Because of what Carl Truman notes. He says, quote, the ascendance of eroticism is perhaps the most socially significant element of the sexual revolution. To be truly human requires that one is immodest. For to be otherwise, to be modest, is to be abnormal. So I want to ask you, gentlemen, I guess first question here, why is it so important to see how these things are connected? And, and, and again, they're being used by social planners against the family today. I, 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 I like your question. So what I'm going to say makes it sound like I don't like your question because I'm going to ask a different question. Do it. What do you think about social planners? Because there's an there's a aspect in my mind that I think, okay, this is all being engineered by the global American empire or, or whatever, um, you know, the WEF or whatever other things I can say to get us flagged. And then there's another part of me that's like, th these people are just worshiping demon gods and they're becoming like them. What, I mean, are there social engineers? What do you think? I, I think so in the broad sense, yes. I think absolutely. So I was reading uh, Days of Vengeance. David Chilton just got my copy. Great. And uh, one of the comments that uh, Gary North makes in there, he says, in the 60s and 70s, Christians sat on their hands. So you had Marxists and other people who were going hard in the paint. They were living like post-mill people. Yeah. And they said, we're taking the institutions. We're taking public education. Yeah. We're going to steal your kids. For moral ends, too. And, and yeah, and Gary North said, he said, the problem was, he says, Christians didn't have a plan yeah. and they didn't think it would work. And, and they ran this play on us that they're running today where they said, right. look, a lot of these issues were couched in moral terms where they were saying, we're going to, this is civil rights. This is freedom from patriarchal oppression, feminism, yeah, and those kinds of things. So the, the, the liberals and the pagans, the, these demonic ideologies always understand this thing that Christians tend to forget, which is that, you know, you can't just, uh, we're, we're, that people are moral creatures. And so we will always, even in our fallen state, find moral arguments compelling. We were created in the image of God, who's holy and thrice holy, right? So- Moral arguments will always be compelling, even when you're twisted in your fallenness yeah. to where your moral compass is pointed at badness. They put this little like, oh, what we're trying to do is civil rights. What we're trying to do is free women from oppression. And then the Christians fail to actually start asking questions about what is your foundational basis for human flourishing? What are your ideas yeah. about the foundations of morality? What is sex for? And, and they just get played yeah. while the, a lot of them sit on their hands. So, so the attack on modesty mm -hmm. that we, that Truman had reference in this, in this amazing quote yeah, is actually an attack on the morals of right. the people. The morality yeah. of a people is the way that they dress. They have a different moral code. Yeah. yeah. Because those morals are the structure holding up society. Yeah. They're, they're the bones that, you know, everything is anchored to and built on. And, uh, even to, to your question, Dan, I think there is, there's like a caricature that you can fall in that there's like three people at the top, Bill Gates, uh, Francis Collins, and, you know, probably, I don't know who's the big Eva, the big, biggest Eva, big Rick, and, uh, let's say, Ed Stetzer, that those three guys are planning everything and they plan the Wuhan flu and they planned everything. And that, you know, this, they're just the puppeteers. It's not really like that, but what you do have, I think is a, the most helpful distinction I've ever heard to understand and read this kind of dynamic is that there are real apostles of demonic ideologies and all of them, even some of them that are on paper at odds with each other, like Islam is not on board with uh, like secular humanism on paper. But they actually are on the same team because there's only two teams. There's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. So you have apostles of these various worldviews is from Islam to secular humanism, and they know what they're doing. Like even if they don't necessarily, even if they really believe that what they're doing is good, they're engineer. They're trying to convince people when they're trying to do what we're trying to do in this podcast, win people to their view of the of the true good and beautiful. And then you have, and there are far more of these people. You have refugees who are people who were successfully discipled by those apostles 
to the worldview, the apostolic view of Islam or secular humanism or whatever else, sexual revolution, the William Blakes, Mary Shelley's, the Freuds, the Jungs, the, uh, you go down the line. And those people, I think, make up a far greater percentage of the world. And they're like the sheep that will follow the shepherd once they decide the shepherd's worthy of following. Maybe he gives them a sugar lump here and then convinces them to follow him out into an asphalt parking lot where there's no grass anymore and just depend on him for sugar lumps to live. You know, they, they, they're, they're sheep, right? So, so there is social planning. There really are these false shepherd apostle types who really are leading masses out onto the asphalt where there's no life. There's only death, right? This, this metaphor is getting away from me, but, <laughs> running away. <laughs> but I think it works. Uh, so that's how I'd explain it. I don't think there's three guys at the top with their fingers on the puppeteer strings of everything so much as I think there are lots of apostles, but there are far more refugees and sheep, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's the ideology. I don't know. I don't remember if it was a Paul Johnson thing in his intellectuals, but sort of the idea that you sort of have most of people in life are sort of the uh, non-character players, I think. What's yeah, they're bit players. Yeah, I mean, like, they just exist in the game. They're not yeah. actually acting on anything. They're extras. I think that probably is a lot of people. You've got a lot of people who, you know, they're going to do what the masses do, including for darkness. Um, yeah. But I definitely think there's, like, these key figures, uh, like the men who ruled history, yeah. With their ideologies. And and they certainly seem to have an awareness of one another. Yeah. And an intentionality to accomplishing some. Totally. Usually for the left, it's some progressive, secular, humanist, perfectionist, utopian. Yeah. Ideal that always ends up Frankenstein. And, and so to your question, what are they trying to do? Yeah. What are the social planners trying to do? Yeah. To the degree that they exist. Part of it actually ties into what we're going to talk about in our, our next episode, Lord willing, on statism. But a lot of it comes down to essentially discipling the masses to think that they're getting freedom and even autonomy and self-rule while actually enslaving them to these monolithic godlike powers. Often it's the state that is going to give them a totalizing view of everything, of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and basically make people completely dependent on these false gods dependent on them for everything. I mean, to me, that's the, the basic shape of the plan. And one of the things that makes that work to our topic today, one of the best hooks you can put on that is sex. It's one of the best ways to um, anesthetize a population. And this is like the bread and circus. Bread and circus, yeah. yeah. It's like giving the gladiators prostitutes. It's that kind of thing. And then there's also, it's not just pleasure, it's also guilt. Because guilt is one of the great manipulators the great manipulative tools of tyrants everywhere is to, if you can weigh a population down with complete moral guilt, they all know they're looking at ridiculously filthy pornography every day of their lives. They're not going to be courageous if they're no, compromised. They're not going to be morally courageous. They know they're bought. Like think about that. I think about politicians all the time and I just imagine maybe it's not actually like this, but I imagine like a congressman who's really an ideologue. He's going to go make change in DC or whatever. First day he gets elected, he goes into his desk, you know, he walks up to his big glory, you know, glorious Oak desk sits down and he's like, I'm going to do some work. And then he looks down and there's a manila manila envelope. And he's like, huh, what, what's that? And he opens it and it's his search history and it's his pictures of him doing sexually illicit things. It's all of the dirt on this guy. And they go do what we say or you're destroyed. That actually happens. I bet that happens. Like, yeah, I think I, you should write a book on it. And if a guy does that, I mean, think about <laughs> I'd, that. I'd read it. Guilt puts a hook in a man or a woman, and it ties a big chain to whatever God they're guilty of worshiping, whatever demon God they're serving. And so they can just get yanked around. So to me, to the point, like, why is sex such a, a, a tool? I think that guilt and pleasure are the two driving forces. Yeah. I think the other thing is just from a, you know, social revolutionary, whether you're talking Marx, Saul Alinsky, Freud, they just understood if you wanted to promote cultural revolution, well, you've got to break down the walls right? and the walls are Christian morality. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. And so one of the things that, I, that, you know, I took away from this a long time ago, I remember reading Frederick Engels and I was like, why is a Marxist writing about the evil of the patriarchal family? Yeah. And then, you know, at some point those things clicked. And so one of the things that I've come away from this with is this is why I'm so big on patriarchy. Mm -hmm. If the enemy knows that patriarchy is the enemy and they are coming out and they're saying the core enemy, I mean, he says it, yeah. Reich does in his quote, yeah. the number one enemy to our agenda 
is the patriarchal family. Particularly Christian, Christian patriarchy. patriarchy. Yeah. So then I go, well, we need to beef you up go, the we, Christian patriarchy. We should probably not get rid of that or like deracinate it or water it down into some complementarian fever dream. Yeah, let's just promote it for what it is. Dan, yeah. do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the ways I, th- I think people hear patriarchy is probably what we don't mean. More of like an Islamic sort of... Woman, give me a sandwich. Well, I mean, uh, I say that all the time. I looked my woman in the eye sockets. Mm-hmm. I told her straight mm-hmm. out. I just said it, man. Yeah. I said it. I said, I said, I said. Um, no, I, <laughs> I just I mean, set like, you up, T-ball. <laughs> Boom. Cracked no, it out of the park. No, no, no. I mean like subjugation, like a tyrant, like a mini right. tyrant over, yeah. over his, you know, over his family, essentially to serve yeah. him as the tyrant. And that's not what we mean. I think it was um, Chris Wiley had mentioned Tom Bombadil as like this ideal patriarchal figure. If you've ever read Lord of the Rings and not just seen the movies, you slackers, you should read the books. So this, this man, one of the most dangerous men in middle earth, he's very concerned about his lady Goldberry. He's she's very, waiting. She's waiting. Yep. Yep. Brian says that all the time when he jets out of here. I say really Goldberry's quick. waiting. And Goldberry's I get out waiting. Here. Yep. Yep. He, uh, he defeats the, the barrel wraith, the barrel white. White, the barrel white. Anyway, so he's a powerful guy, right? Really happy, really jovial. The th- I'm, I'm getting to a point in all of this. I'm not just talking I, about I'm following Tom you. Bombadil. This is good. This is a good connection. So this man who he knows his forest, he knows the trees, he knows his land, he knows his responsibilities. He's a dangerous man. He's not going to be attacked easily. Enemies fear him. His friends respect him. Mm-hmm. His lady loves him. He produces a lot of good things in his in his areas his domain, of responsibilities. Yeah. And so you see this, um, this principle of patriarchy being broken down, even in our military, to where everybody's transient. They have no sense of place. They don't have their, their forests that they're tending. They don't have their communities. Uh, this is, I think, when you look back at like the Civil War and you have this, this Southern culture and you have men that are actually fighting for their place. Yeah. They're fighting for their homes. They're fighting for their farms. Those people are really dangerous. Yeah. Those people are really dangerous because they have a sense of place. They have, they know where their areas of responsibility yep. are. They have their women and children and communities depending upon them in order to protect and to provide for them. Yeah. You know, where they've taken up the mantle of responsibility. And so if you can eliminate that, yeah. if you can essentially neuter the patriarchy yes. so that nobody is looking to anybody except the state. Yeah. For protection and provision, you can manipulate anybody to do anything. Yes. It, 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 cultures are built by men with families to feed. That's right. Whoever Doug said Wilson. that, Doug, Doug Wilson. Wilson. And it, when you look at the play that's being run, that's so profound. And both of, both of you, what you teed up here is that essentially these fake God figures who are trying to be God the Father, they're conspiring to become the Father. And so they have to neuter all the other fathers, like it, eunuchs it, in the court of an emperor. It's an orc relationship with people. Yes. Right? It's not true fruitfulness. Yes. And so if you can neuter them, make them imp- make all the men impotent, weak, and laden with guilt, pursuing fake sex, fake dominion in video games, fake, right. fake, what, fruit, fake everything. Fake fruit, fruitfulness. I think Michael Foster talks about that a little bit. But, you know, and then if you can, if you do that, then the next thing that will fall is the women. The, the, the fruitfulness of women, they'll, the men will stand aside while the women then in order to become objects of sexual pleasure for men will chemically castrate themselves. The women will make themselves infertile chemically, copper IUDs and hormonal birth control, progesterone and all that. And then what do you have? You have this pacified, guilt laden, low T, uncourageous men who have, they own nothing. They have no ownership in what happens. No, they own won't space. fight for anything. So they don't care. We're going to talk about own space in this season, by the way, at some point. So we won't keep, we, I don't think we'll, we'll go fully down this. There's going to be stuff we leave on the table here, but the agenda, like the reason sex is so central to the agenda of the, the central planners to the degree that they exist is, is exactly this. Sex is one of the greatest tools that you can a misuse that you can corrupt in order to corrupt the patriarchs. Yeah, that's right. And I think fundamentally all of this comes down to something Jordan Peterson has talked about agents of chaos. On the one hand, Mm -hmm. Satan's regime is chaos. Yeah. You can create a a lot of chaos through sexual, you know, misdirection. Yeah. On the other hand, what's amazing here, and this is kind of where I want to tie things up 
for our listeners. Um, in Titus, when the world is a mess, Paul tells Titus, go and appoint elders. Yeah. Elders are fathers who have ruled well in their own existence. Mm. So, you know, we might even quote Mother Teresa at this point, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. One of the things, gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, but that we ought to be doing is going home and leading well in that realm. Uh, one of the things I want to do, I'm going to quote E. Michael Jones here. Yeah. And then I want to ask you, what, what tangibly and practically does that look like? So, to, again, to tie off the Enlightenment, Michael Jones says this. So, in the end, the Enlightenment failed, and we all have to depend on when the monsters it created attack is self-sacrifice, family ties, and blood willing to be sacrificed for the greater good. In other words, the blood of the cross, the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the lamb. If not, you might want to consider that option as you stand around in the ruined subway stations of enlightenment culture that all the technology and everything else that it gave us is ruined. There is nothing left but the blood of the cross. Wow. Michael Jones. That is a profound quote. He wrote Monsters from the Id and Sexual Degenerate, Modern Degenerates. Mm -hmm. This is from Monsters from the Id. Yeah. And I would also recommend on this. C.R. Wiley's The Household of the War for the Cosmos. Amazing. Ties together some of these, these concepts. Yeah, that is, that's a profound, I mean, just think about a lot of the themes of this season. We're talking about these shanty towns and slums that have been built by both uh, unfaithfulness in the church and, uh, and idolatry in the world. And, and, and we're saying, like Boniface, go and knock those things down, clear down to the ground, tear up the, the foundation stones, throw them to the side till you get down to good earth that God made and then start putting down some real foundation stones. And at the bottom, no amount of cultural commentary, no amount of book reading, no amount of clever human philosophy will do a dang thing to build the cathedral of Christendom if there at the bottom on the first stone you don't put down Christ. You don't put down the blood of Christ, shed for sinners, new life in Christ. If you don't build Christianly, whatever you build, even if it looks better than what was there before, and that's not that difficult right now, you know, that's, that's certainly not difficult. Like in Carl or what's his name? Jordan Peterson's a good example of this. Not, not a Christian that I know of, uh, maybe close, whatever I, the Lord knows, but what he's building is like what he's telling. If you listen to him instead of the, a lot of the other pagans, it's like, you'll do better. But best of all, like even that will tumble over and topple unless you build on Christ. Yeah. It's just a better road to the same hell. Yeah. You have to say, so God, what- the father, God, the son, God, the spirit at the bottom, the real father, not the fake fathers. And if you do that stone down at the bottom, then you can build a civilization. You can build an emp- you can build something that lasts. Yeah. So that 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 question, Dan, of building, you know, what are the cornerstones that you build upon? I, I would say Christian worship has to be central. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, what other practical things should we do? You know, in our families, households, churches, etc. And as I ask that, the reason I ask is because a lot of Christians will say we need a robust Christian worldview. And so, like, my generation was all about worldview while going to public school. Right. Yeah, they undermined the mission. Which was like, well, that was just yeah, here's Here's what we should do. We should have a, a Christian worldview and then not do anything to actually produce a Christian worldview. And right. they, so, they just meant doctrine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm asking that question of if Christians need to win in, like, say, a couple ways now, where do we aim our guns? Yeah, I think this, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, uh, sphere sovereignty. Different, yeah, different spheres of Government, of course, you've heard of this mm, before. Mm. Uh, Matt Trujella has an interesting book that touches on this, The Doctrine, of the, the doctrine <laughs> of the Lesser Magistrates. Anyway, so you have these different spheres of government. He, he actually gives four spheres, I think. He includes the self. The self. Either he does or I added that one in my Sunday school class. One of those two. Well, it's no, also I, in I uh, actually God and taught, Government. Did he? Okay, cool. You're, yeah, I you're, taught the class on the book. So anyway, oh yeah, that's right. You, sorry, you actually did teach in, the class inside on inside yeah, yeah, yeah. the house, you know stuff. So you have these different uh, spheres of governance. You have yourself, your the family, the church, and the state. And so within these spheres of authority, right rule is vital. And you cannot have right rule without right law. I mean, law. Uh, and rule being like governing. Yeah. And so it has to be God's law. First and foremost, at every, every step at, of government, you have to have Christ and his law paramount as the standard. So anytime that you approach any area of life, you want to talk about real Christian worldview, 
So what does the scripture say? Do I believe it? Because you should. If you don't, you've got a problem. Mm. And then you apply it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's simple. First and foremost, Christian worldview and, and godly rule yeah. in those different spheres. And obviously, that's, that could be a whole series in itself. Yeah. But, but that's really the key maybe, at, at, at every turn. Yeah, maybe one of the big points here, though, and Brian, we were talking about this earlier, but Christian education for children. Obviously, yeah. we learned that they're going after the patriarchy. Yeah. But one of the key things we learned is they're going after, sexually, they're going after our kids. Yeah. It's, How do we fortify? I think that, you know, at the bottom, you, you have to start realizing that we're in a culture that is like the Ninevites, that doesn't know its right hand from its left hand, morally, socially. It just, it has no clue. Our culture has been, for a couple generations or more, successfully discipled uh, into the image of false gods, uh, away from God the Father, has wholeheartedly, in many cases, embraced statism, sexual folly, basically has corrupted all four of those governments where we don't have self-ruled men and women who, who rule well because they are ruled by Christ and so rule their own spirits well, rule over their emotions. They're, so they're easily manipulated because they're not ruling them. They're a city without walls, like Proverbs says. So we don't have, you know, of course, if you don't have self-ruled men and women, you won't have self-ruled homes or, or godly homes. So we have men who grow up not to know, they don't know what a husband is for, what, what marriage is for. They don't know what their strength is for. We have women who don't know what it means to be a woman. So we, we have churches that are filled with, you know, pastorates and, and local church communities that appoint elders who, of course, they, they're not qualified elders because they don't even know what it means to govern a household well, right? Like, like First Timothy 3, 4, and 5 commands. And so we make the state is just a family writ large in a lot of ways. It's the, the city fathers are fools. So, so on every level, we've lost the most basic uh, understanding of how to live a human life. Every part of what it means to be human has been corrupted by sin and the sin has crept through and then created devastation. So to me, the place to point your guns are just to relentlessly talk about the most basic, basic aspects of Christian living. So like Deuteronomy 6. Just the most basic. We have got to refigure out what is a boy? What is a girl? What is a man? What is a woman? What is a household? What is it for? What is the economic world and sphere? What is it for? What is the church? What is it supposed to be doing? What is its mission? What is mankind pointed at? What does it look like to be a glorious man and a glorious woman? You know, so that we get these targets established rightly. Because the problem, until you aim at the right target, everything you do is going to be, even if it, you're, I mean, you might have a 50 cal, doesn't matter if you're not shooting at the enemy or if you, yeah. you know, you might have the, the best hiking boots on your feet. You're not going to get where you're trying to go until you have a working compass and you know where you're, where you're headed. So it's like, we've got to figure those things out. And to your point about education, this is why Christians have to f figure out, they have to get this, they have to pass this test. I'll put it this way. Christians need to pass this test that we've been consistently failing for three to five generations. And it is the test of covenant succession and discipleship succession through the generations. Well, and what, one of the things on this point that I always hear from people is basically covenant succession doesn't work, you know, be a faithful parent, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. And really I think what's happening in those situations, what you have in America is a country that's catechized by Cardi B and not the church. Yeah. And so what did you expect to happen? You're right. not actually believing the promise if you do that. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, you take, think, thinking about um, our children in this test of cultural transmission and education and, and, and that, you know, side of things and this test that we've been failing, it's like, we have this, we've talked about this before, antinomian culture. One of the ways that the church has been played is by buying this antinomian lie that when the Bible says things about do this and you'll be blessed, do, uh, do this other thing and you'll be cursed, that that actually means something. So we have a world or we have, a, we have pastors and churches and a whole theological culture that has managed to come up with clever theological ways of saying that the verse in Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he won't depart from it, actually means train up a child in the way he should go. And I don't know, flip a coin because it's, it's by grace. Not it doesn't really works. matter anyway. Yeah, we, we do this absolutely asinine, uh, antinomian, quote unquote, gospel centered uh, error where we, we, we end up denying the, the things that God blesses and curses. 
And so then we think that we can just do the things God says he won't bless. And because we're under grace and not law, that there will be no consequences. And one of these things is that we've just utterly failed to disciple and catechize our children. In fact, we've given them consistently to a state that literally doesn't know what a boy and a girl is. And we're telling that state, hey, you have my total permission, uh, 15,000 hours by the time they're 18. You can teach them about everything, well, yeah. almost everything. We teach them about th- theology. Well, and one of those issues, though, is human sexuality. So when, when I was growing up, yeah. like the purity culture church was like, Sex was an off, it was taboo, right? It, well, sex it was is gross, like, so save it for the one you love. Yeah, sex is great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't ever do it, except when you get married, then it's okay. And don't ever ask me about it again. However, what would happen is you'd go to school and your biology teacher would talk all about well, like, sex. Yeah, let's talk about it. And so, again, Dan, I think we have to make sure that we're the ones doing the catechizing. Yes, absolutely. I agree that we should be the ones doing the catechizing. You know, something that I want to piggyback off yeah. of what you said a little bit earlier about the Proverbs, uh, the mm-hmm. Proverbs say like, um, something to the effect, I'm sure you guys can cre- correct me. Uh, those who spare the rod hate their child. Spoil the child. Yeah. Uh, well, it, those you, who neglect hate discipline, hate, yeah, your, you actually hate your son. You hate your child. Yeah. And this idea that covenant succession is something that's like a, f- a fallacy or like a myth. Yeah. Or I don't know. I don't know how you actually wrap your mind around that. Well, I think a lot of people Dan. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I think no, no. a lot of people today, simply don't think that covenants apply to say, you know, 21st century Americans. The irony of all of that is the covenant curses are written everywhere across our culture. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. We're evidence. Yes, that's exactly right. So covenant succession is, is important that we get this. And along with covenant succession, there's discipleship where you're training your children in faith. You're believing the promises. Again, you're not saying that your, chi- that your uh, children are saved by the their good works of their parents. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is, is that Ephesians 2.10 is true. We're saying that we are Christ's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he set before us that we should walk in them. Mm. And we're believing Philippians that it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, so God is supplying the grace at every step in our hearing, our believing and our obeying of scripture, including those promises and passages where he commands us to train our children up, to take, to say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord along with Joshua, to train them in the Lord's paideia. And, and I think this, this looks like two, two aspects that we, in a really blue collar way, we need to figure out. One of them is offense and one of them is defense. So defense is important. People say, well, you're homeschooling, you're private schooling, Christian school, you're just putting your kids in a bunker. And, on, on, and everyone wants to say like, oh, no, 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 we don't, we're not bunkering. And I'm like, yes, part of what you need if you are going to wage a strategic military campaign against an entrenched enemy is you need to have defense. Like you need to have trenches, you need to have bunkers, you got to have some armor, you got to figure things out. Training facilities. Yeah, right. Like you'd have barracks, you have basic, you know, basic training is thousands of miles away from the enemy often for a reason. It's because we need, we need to actually protect our children. So there's defense where we're saying no screens, no smartphones, no government schools, no world's catechism, no unlimited television, no stupid stuff where we're saying no to all of that. And then there's offense where we're training our children actively. We're introducing them to simulated conflict. We're saying there's, there are people, our neighbors believe this, and they're going to try to tell you this. And so what do we say to that young man, young woman, where we're training them? And, and to give an example, an example would be, imagine two scenarios of a father taking his child to the local park. You know, at our house, we go out our front door, we get the stroller all unloaded, you know, we put all the water bottles, and by the time you're ready to go to the park, it feels like you have half of your house in the bottom of the stroller. (laughs) You put your kids in the stroller, one of them says, can I ride my bike, one of them, you know, whatever. You get all your kids bundled up, you're walking down the street, you're looking both ways, maybe you hear the cars going past, don't don't run out in the street, don't get hit by the car, whatever. You walk your way over to the local park, and you, okay, kids, go play. And one dad has done defense and he's done offense. And so at one point, one of his other kids runs over to the bathroom. He has to walk him over there. 
and he's occupied, and a stranger approaches his child, his little girl, say a five-year-old girl, and says, hey, I need help finding my lost puppy. Can you, uh, I need, can you hurry quick? I, I can't find it. We need, we need to find this puppy. Hop, hop in my car. We'll drive down the street. And you keep your eyes open while I drive. Let's say one dad in this scenario has done his offense and defense. And he said, now, little, little Daphne, my little Daphne, there are men, there are people in the world who will try to take you from mommy and daddy. They'll try to steal you and do horrible things to you. And they'll, they'll try to take you and you'll never see mommy and daddy again try to get you to get in their car and they might say this and they might say this and they might say they lost their puppy they might say they have candy for you they might say that your mommy told them to go get you and to meet you at home and you're gonna drive them and as soon as that person says that you yell at the top of your lungs and you run away and you will never get in trouble if you were wrong to have done that or and if they try to grab you you fight and kick and bite and scream and you do it and you've trained them in the offense and the defense Right, You've done everything you can to protect them. You wouldn't just drop them off at the park and leave for six hours. But here's the reality in the world is that enemies are going to come when you're not there. So, so, I mean, you have to train your kids on both sides. Another dad might do that. have never talked to his kids about that. Little girl gets in the car, door slams. He drives away. Horrible predator. Never see her again. It just happens. And, and this, so, so when we're talking about this, what do we need to set our sights on with our children, with training our children? We've got to just, in a blue-collar way, figure out how to do both sides. In the defense, protect them from the world, but also the offense, so that when we're not there, when they grow up, when they hear, when they get the smartphone and someone pulls out the pornography, or when they, when they hear the, the professor in college, even as a 20-year-old, or, so that they're ready to handle the foolishness of these worldviews. And, and guys, this is one of the reasons why we make fun of gay stuff and why we... Why we mock because I, I not only do I want my children to know that those things are not true, good and beautiful. I want them to think they are laughable. I want them to look at the LGBTQ agenda and think it is absurd. And fundamentally that's what they are catechizing your kids to do in public school is to laugh and scoff at, at Christianity. That's what one of the things Freud did was, you know, Relegating religion to the infantile stage and saying, oh. it's just laughable. We don't even need to talk about it. It's yep. so stupid. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I think that laughter and mocking yep. in, in like an Elijah way, the, yes. the false gods and these, these actually ridiculous ideologies. Yeah. They are literally saying that you can be men, you can be a woman. They're so stupid. I mean, it's, it's really stupid. You should laugh at them. Well, it reminds you, me. Not, I mean, like not at the individual person, yeah. but at those ideas, yeah. you should laugh at them. And one of the dangers from the past is that what our fathers did is they taught us to fear mm. certain ideologies as like, these, these are really dangerous. Oh, yeah. Like evolution is really dangerous and it is really dangerous, but that was the wrong tool right. in your tool belt. Yeah. Mm. They should have said, you think that we came from some sort of hermaphrodite misshapen yeah. fish? There are idiots. That's, that's it. There are. Yeah. There are idiots who think that all life came from a rock and some water that mixed together and got struck by lightning and then some other stuff happened. Isn't that absurd, children? There are people who believe, you know, like Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman that he's That's doing right now? That's what I was going to bring Dude, up. He goes to the, the primitive African village. Did you see the video? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he starts asking him these questions like through a translator. Like, now, can a man become a woman? And then and the he's like, laughs. And he asks the question. And then they all start laughing. And he's like, did I ask an absurd question? And, and of course, Matt Walsh knows. Of course, yeah. You know, course, but yeah. <laughs> it's like people, people, they get offended by some of the stuff we do in the mockery side of things. They don't understand what we're aiming for. We're mainly with that side, with the satiric serrated edge stuff. We're mainly not trying to convince our ideological opponents to come to our view. We're mainly trying to protect our children. We're mainly trying to protect our sheep. Right. We're mainly trying to frame your worldview, listener or people influenced by our materials, to do the right thing when they're faced with that. And they're like the, the little girl that immediately screams, kicks, bites, and runs when the predator comes. Right. When you laugh at the at The, the, the apostles, emperor that's not wearing clothes. Yes. And you say- And he's you're naked. not the sycophants that are too afraid to say anything. That's right. Because that's dangerous. Yeah. You have to laugh at it. You have to laugh at it. And, and then when you, when you come face to face with the refugee of the culture who's been broken and destroyed by it and, and, and is suicidal and doesn't know what they're supposed to do, 
you don't let them run the play on you where like, it's your hate speech that's making that person suicidal. No, it's your demonic ideology that you've discipled them in and it leads to death. And so what we do is then we bring in the, the love of Christ. We bring in the restoration of Christ and we give them what the, the demons can't give them, which is actual hope, actual purpose, actual understanding, actual knowledge, actual life, actual right. humanity. That's right. That's beautiful. I think it's a good place for us to end this episode. Gentlemen, we are sponsored by Reformation Heritage Books in this episode. Brian, what is so great about Reformation Heritage Books? You know, what What I think that along these educational lines, one of the mistakes that we can make and that, our, that, that some of the previous generations have made and that we might be prone to make is to think that we've got to reinvent all this stuff, this, well, they don't know their right hand from their left hand, so we better figure out how to do everything by ourselves from the ground up. Well, no, we have this rich legacy of faith. We're Protestant, Reformed Christians, which means that we're a people who love words. We're a people who have rich inheritance in literature and in uh, sermons and in media, and people have fought battles who have gone before us. And so you need to have, you need to have publishers like Reformation Heritage Books who are preserving this library of our forefathers' wisdom and also promoting that wisdom to continue in a living way today. So, you know, we said it before, I'd, I'd recommend you guys go pick up one of their Family Worship Bible Guide. Family Worship Bible Guide. Heritagebooks.org. Yeah, go, go pick one of those up. And if you haven't already, start catechizing your kids. Uh, start teaching them. Help them to laugh at what they're supposed to laugh at. To run when the predator comes, kick and scream. And uh, play the offense, play the defense. And then also for many of us, we grew up, we were uncatechized. And so pick up, pick up some good books, pick up some Puritan works, pick up some, some of the works of our forefathers and uh, put your hand to the plow. Do that hard work of learning. Old dogs can learn new tricks. Trust, trust us. That's what we do every week here at the King's Hall as we prepare for these episodes. Uh, but, but I think you'll be well served if you do that. Absolutely. Well, until next time, we say to our listeners, he who conquers must conquer himself. 